36 in Tuesday's game one win. Steph Curry is in the building. Certainly a backcourt battle, and it went to the Splash Brothers in game one. CJ McCollum just 17 on one of five from deep. We'll see if the Blazers can get it going in a building that has not been kind to them. Oracle, where Portland has lost five in a row as a visitor. They'll try and change their luck and even up the series tonight when the ball goes up just after 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. So just about two hours away from tip off of game two. Welcome to game time live playoff style getting you set for game two of the Western Conference Finals. Jared Greenberg, you know these Hall of Famers. You see them each and every night here on NBA TV. Grant Hill, Isaiah Thomas, and a man who is going to join them as an enshrinee in a few short years. We welcome to our NBA TV studios the great Chris Boss. Chris, thanks for being with us. Thank you, man. Glad how, you, how you been feeling, man? I've been feeling great. Knees feel good. It's all good. Well, the, the, <laughs> the last time we saw you, other than watching you on the Twitter show last night, was when you got your jersey retired by the Miami Heat. How cool of a night was that? I mean, that was an amazing night. My, my family was there. I mean, I haven't had all of my family at an NBA arena in quite some time. You know, that happens as you get older. But to have them there, we're a very prideful family. And so, you know, Dallas, Texas, Houston, Texas was represented very well uh, uh, that night. And we're very proud. I mean, it's just crazy that they could see Bosch, my grandfather's name, <laughs> in an NBA arena. I mean, right. uh, yeah. the thing <laughs> I remember most about that night was you just saying, I just want to hear the roar. Let's do that roar. Oh, I'm yeah, because you I can't mean, yell at people in, in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was pretty cool. It's funny you mention it, because here in Studio B, sometimes we need a little energy. We need to get going a little bit. These guys worked until late in the, the wee hours of the morning last night. Can, can yeah. you get us going here? Absolutely. Up? I'll be that guy coming off the bench, so we're going to have a good one today. Can you give us a little roar? Absolutely. Let's go. Give us ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you're only here for the pregame uh, show. The rest of us are here all night. Yeah. You don't have to pace yourself. Oh, you know? we'll, we'll, we'll get it going, man. No problem. All right. we'll, Chris we'll, Bosch we'll with work us. Out just fine. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the Eastern Conference Finals with one of your former teams, the Toronto Raptors, involved in that a little later on. But let's, let's talk more about the Western Conference Finals and that battle of the backcourt. Man, oh, man, was it dominated by the Splash Brothers in Game 1, outscoring CJ and Damian 62-36. to 36. I mean, Steph Curry, what he was able to do alone from three-point territory, hitting nine from downtown by himself. So tonight, game number two out in Oracle. And before we get the ball thrown up in the air, we go courtside to 3D Dennis Scott, who is joining us. 3D, appreciate your time here. Tonight, tonight will be the third straight game. The Warriors will play without Kevin Durant due to that calf injury. Now, ESPN is reporting this afternoon that Durant is not close to game action. What's the latest you're hearing about when KD could possibly get back on the court? Well, just talking to the Warriors, Brass, KD will be reevaluated at 530 to look at the leg and see how it's coming the calf. But I'm going to keep honest with you guys. I talked to KD off camera yesterday. He's excited to get back on the court, but he's not ready to rush anything back. He wants it to be 100%. And obviously, when the Warriors play so well in game one, why would you rush back, guys? Yeah, that certainly did not hurt the cause to keep him out for much longer, 3D. Now, right after game one, Coach Terry Stotts of the Blazers got defensive about their defense. Now that he's had some time to cool down, do, do you believe the Blazers will make some adjustments to their defense, defensive coverage, particularly against Steph? They, they have to. When you have nine uncontested three points and shots, you know, come on, this is Steph Curry. So you have to tweak your defense. So I know the coaching staff went back and watched the film and saw that every screen that Cantor was involved in and Steph was able to come off the screen, he was wide open and knocked down shots. Same thing with Klay Thompson. There was like four or five wide open, uncontested threes as well when he came off pin downs and flare screens. So they have to tweak that defense. You know, 3D, when we go to the other side and you talk about Dame and CJ, every time they came off a screen, they were either trapped or hard hedged. They didn't get to come off, square up, take a good look. How do you think Stotts is going to free those two up tonight where they can have some freedom and not necessarily be regulated or regi regimented to just screen and roll play? One or two things I say, you're either going to want a one-four flat like Coach Stott did in game seven against the Denver Nuggets and let CJ go one-on-one. -on -one. He was able to get to his mid-range game. But you got to give the Warriors a lot of credit. They switch with purpose. They switch and deny. They switch and get under so you can't slip to the basket. So somehow you have to get better movement, 
better ball movement if you want to attack this Warrior defense. So I look for CJ or Dame to get off tonight somehow, some way. Otherwise, they'll go down 0-2 tonight. And 3D, to continue with that thought, Dame Lillard really struggled. Had more turnovers in game one than he's had in the last five months. I thought Klay Thompson uh, and Andre Iguodala did a great job on him. Their length gave him problems. Uh, any, any idea in terms of what Dame will do one-on-one -on -one against those guys, uh, not used to going against guys that maybe have that kind of size and length but also have the lateral quickness as well to stay in front of them? Grant, you bring up such a great point with the Warriors' defense with their length. So now when Dame comes down here, we use that term a lot, he sees nothing but elbows and arms and fingers. So all those turnovers we saw in the first half were very uncharacteristic for Dame. So I know he went back and watched the film. So Isaiah, you notice as a point guard, I look for him to be a little more aggressive when he gets to the rim, try to finish early on and not look for passes, look for his own game, and maybe that gets him going. And uh, 3D, you know, I'm just really making things up off the cuff. How is it seeing phenomenal shooters like that be open? Were you that open when uh, you were playing in the playoffs? <laughs> CB4, I wish I could be this <laughs> wide open on the wing, knock down shots. So, no, I was never that wide open. You know the old term, don't leave him, otherwise you're coming out the ball game. <laughs> hey, hey, 3D, what about Ennis Cantor? How much he does offensively, we know. But is he playable in this series with his defensive liabilities? Well, if they're going to continue to use Cantor in the high pick and roll and he's not willing to step up, you have to bring him off the floor. Otherwise, we'll be jump shot after jump shot. And we know when you do that, they'll show us they're the best shooters in the ball game. So somehow, maybe Collins or someone else comes off the bench. You have to show hedge hard. Otherwise, let it fly, guys. That is his motto, 3D Dennis Scott. Appreciate you joining us here. Enjoy the game. We'll check in with you afterwards. Yes, sir. There he is, 3D. We'll be back with much more getting you set for game two of the Western Conference Finals. And here is Canter's in the building. We'll see what adjustments they make to get him out of the paint and actually guard someone. Here's your coach arrival shot, Steve Kerr. He's in the building at Oracle getting set for game two, which will tip off on ESPN tonight just after 9 Eastern. And remember, join us here on NBA TV for full post-game coverage as soon as the game is over tonight out at Oracle. Well, game one was just a dominant performance on both sides of the basketball by the Golden State Warriors. Not only were they distributing and shooting the three, but they're also playing incredible defense. Third straight playoff game, the Golden State Warriors have held their opponents to under 100 points. And Steph Curry is averaging 31 points over the last four games. They've been doing so well without Kevin Durant. 28-1 over their last 29 games without Kevin Durant in the lineup. Back on Game Time Live, getting you set for Game 2 of the West Finals with Chris Bosh in studio with us. Of course, Grant Hill, Isaiah Thomas, Jared Greenberg. So let's start here with you, Isaiah, about what, what you saw from Golden State against Portland and just how dominant they were and how that ball movement and man movement really shines when Kevin Durant's not in the lineup. You know, I, I've, I've said this before. Go, Golden State plays with perfect randomness. So mm -hmm. when you talk about ball movement and player movement, you know, they read and react and they play off each other. So there's no set pattern of play that you can really understand how to play against. So you really have to defend, depend on your defensive principles and your tactics in terms of what you've practiced and played against. And here on any type of screen and roll situation, we see that the big is laying back and Steph is just coming off. And these are, these are just warm-up shots. These are, the, these are the shots really that he practices before the game mm -hmm. when he brings the audience out and everybody's just watching him shoot. That's what the Trailblazers were doing, just basically watching him shoot. And they're going to have to do something totally different tonight. But the randomness that Golden State plays with is very difficult to guard because of the passing, the moving, and the cutting. Yeah, and, and Isaiah, that scheme was wrong. Look, uh, all wrong for Portland. Uh, Steph Curry, the best shooter in the history of the game, 23 shots, 12 of them uh, were wide open. <laughs> and so you can't give the best player in the game a shot. There's got to be an adjustment. Uh, we talked about that defensively for Portland. But I, I want to come out here and demonstrate. Oh, here we go. And I want Isaiah, since he's, you know, one of the great point guards of all time to be Steph Curry. Oh, and I want... Steph, I'm shooting it, baby. <laughs> Steph Curry, my dream has come true. I got a J like Steph Curry. <laughs> See, that, that's the ultimate respect right there. Ultimate respect. But uh, Chris, Chris Bosh, you were one of the best big men at defending the screen and roll. Sometimes you would switch, sometimes you would hard show. I'm just curious, going against Steph Curry, I'll be the, the big man offensively. 
you're guarding me, mm -hmm. coming up, and I'm setting a screen. And what would you try to do against a great shooter like a Steph Curry as well, I'm setting the screen? One of the things when you get this far, and you guys know, when you get this far in the playoffs, it's going to be hard regardless. You're going to play against great players and great talent, some of which the world has never seen. It's hard enough guarding Steph, uh, Steph Curry, coming off of screens constantly and guarding against that randomness. I always try to think of what I would do. But one of the things I definitely wouldn't do is be back in the paint. I would kind of try to be up on the screen a little bit. If you're here, I want to be at least right here and be level and then at least give my teammate a chance to get up into his body. Now, the hard part is when he makes these pocket passes to Draymond Green and they get going, but you kind of have to pick your poison then. Mm -hmm. Are you going to allow Steph Curry to beat you or are you going to allow Draymond? And Draymond can make plays and get guys in rhythm. But if Steph isn't scoring and he's not getting those clean looks, I just want to be up as much as possible. And you know what? He's going to make a lot in my face. That's just going to be the point of it. Well, Chris, you were one of the most agile big men defensively. And we saw Houston was a, a team that liked to switch. Mm -hmm. Would you be comfortable in a situation where all of a sudden Draymond sets the screen and switch and now you're one-on-one -on -one matched up? with a Steph Curry out on the perimeter? Of course I wouldn't be comfortable, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing to do, we live in the age of data. Use your data in this point. I don't know what his weakest move is, but if I'm a big, I'm, I'm Steph going Curry, to assume, baby. The data don't work. Uh, all right, hey, well, if the data, if well, the data well, whatever, doesn't work. Whatever the data is telling you, <laughs> hey, the, the data says Well, the come data does here, tell me that he's shooting 51% from the oh, three. Oh, no, you got to so come I'm a gonna further. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And you know what? He's probably going to beat me off the dribble, but at least I'm taking him off that three and forcing him down to help. That gives us a better shot. I'm not saying it's going to work, but it'll give you a better shot. Let me go back to what Terry Stott said right after the game when he was so defensive with Anthony Slater of The Athletic who asked about why didn't you do all that and Coach Stott said well did you see the second half of game six Friday night where Steph Curry scored 33 points and Coach Stott threw it back at the reporter and said well were they doubling him then and he said yes they were so what he goes so we'll look at the tape on that then what's the answer I mean there is no correct answer right but when Enos Cantor is is as vulnerable as he is how do you make up for his weaknesses let alone find Steph's weaknesses look man I mean, he's got two MVP trophies. Right. So, and, and a lot One more. One unanimous. Rings. Okay. So, that never happens. So, he's one of the best players in the world at what he does. It's going to be hard enough, like I keep saying. You just want to hope that he misses. You want to give him as many contests as you can, easier said than done. But you want to hope that he misses those shots. And when he, if and when he misses those shots, you got to get rebounds. You can't turn the ball over in the open court. You have to keep that down. Portland, I think, will do a better job of taking care of the ball in game two. All right, let's switch and, and come back so we don't freak out all the lighting people here. We'll come back into the paint <laughs> and talk about the other side of the basketball with what the Portland Trailblazers are going to have to try and do. We, we saw in their series against uh, last series where, where they got Hood and Cantor involved to, to make up if Lillard wasn't having a great game, but he has not been shooting the basketball well. CJ had been shooting the basketball well. He didn't shoot it well. What, what has to happen here, Isaiah, with this Portland team to get going? I think that the only way you can really be, you know, in my opinion, a, a Golden State team that plays as well as they do. And we were in the back, Chris, and we was talking with Channing Fry, And, you know, Channing was giving us, you know, some of the ways that they tried to play against Golden State. And either you got to take all your bigs off the floor and match down to their small game, their perimeter players. You can't. This may be a series you can't play Cantor in. And if you're going to play Cantor, then you got to put the ball down low. You got to put it into the post. You got to make it nasty. You got to let them score around the basket. You got to let them get people in foul trouble. And Channing Fry again, he, he made the, uh, the beautiful point last night. He said, it gives you a chance to set your defense. Because when you use the post, you can score down low. You can get back in transition. You can play five on five. And if you get fouled, you can go to the foul line, get free throws, and set your defense. But when you letting Golden State run up and down the floor and don't have a chance to really set your defense and you're playing with bigs who traditionally are post players, but you're not using them in the post, then you're basically playing five on four out there. And that's what we saw Golden State was doing with Portland last night. Does, does Damian Lillard night. have to force the issue a little more? 
You know, I think he has to be aggressive. I mean, he, he, you know, he's somebody who I think will have a better game. He's had a, a tough game seven against Denver, uh, a tough one going back to where he grew up, game one the other night. Uh, so he, he will make, I think, the necessary adjustments, and, and the great players do. Um, I, I think he got a little, as you can see, out of control. Uh, obviously, the turnovers were too much. And this is a team that when you turn the ball over, they're scoring twos and threes on the other end in transition. So valuing the basketball, uh, being aggressive. But I, I, I love what, what Isaiah said in that maybe Cantor doesn't play in this. Maybe you go to Collins, who may be more of a mobile big, or maybe you just go small. and you Because, you know, Golden State, that was it called, the Hamptons Five, or that, right, yeah. that small lineup that can switch everything. It causes so many problems right. uh, offensively when you're trying to execute. And then the way they move the ball, I love the term you use, random. Perfect randomness. Perfect random, because you can't plan for some of the stuff. They just play out of principles. And so it's not like you can diagram defensively what you're going to do. So you got to have guys that are comfortable playing out on the perimeter, comfortable switching, comfortable being paranoid on the weak side. That, to me, both offensively and defensively, is how you have to approach the Golden State Warriors. Chris, what are you, what are you seeing out there from Portland's standpoint when they're trying to take down Goliath? Well, I mean, you have to play almost perfect basketball. And that was game one. Game ones are tough. You know, they built a cadence to playing defense against the, the Denver Nuggets. They get used to seeing the same guys, and then all of a sudden, you're on the road against the defending champs. They've got to make sure that they get back to their game. I think if you look to a lot of those uh, highlights, their spacing was off. Um, a lot of bad turnovers, unforced turnovers especially, that gets them out in transition. Like Isaiah was saying, you're in no man's land, especially on the road. They need to just take care of the ball, take good shots. And I think, um, you know, Dame should be aggressive because he's one of their guys. When he's aggressive, no matter if he's making or missing, that team is going to play well. And for him, some added motivation because if they lose tonight, it could be Dame's last ever building, ever game in this building in the city that he grew up in, in Oakland. So he wants to avoid that and try and force a Game 5 back in Oracle coming up in a couple of days. We'll come back and talk more about the Western Conference Finals, but also shift gears and look to the Eastern Conference Finals. <laughs> Get that ball, Greg. Come on, Steve. Steve. You're pretty quick, Steph. You're pretty quick, Steph Curry. Hey, Brooke Lopez is the best Chris Bosh impersonation I got last night. Talking Steph, about I like Milwaukee you. and Toronto. <laughs> Curry, 36 points on 23 shot attempts. An efficient game one victory. Also had seven assists and six rebounds. He was real good. They're still playing without Kevin Durant. Let's hear more on that and get you set for game two by going inside of Oracle to the podium where Steve Kerr is. Uh, John Dickinson, 95-7 the game. But do you have an update on, on Kevin? He's supposed to be reevaluated today. Yeah, he's going to be um, evaluated by our team doctors this evening before the game. And we'll have a statement out, I think, um, after that. Obviously, he won't play tonight, um, but uh, we'll we'll give you the update um, after he's evaluated by the by the team doctors. Fourth row, middle. <clears throat> Tony Harvey, Sacramento Observer, and uh, Demarcus Cousin. Uh, where is he at in this process? Uh, Demarcus is coming along. Uh, He's starting to do some work on the floor, uh, so he's, um, you know, he's not exactly close to playing in a game, but he's uh, he's making good strides with his rehab and and uh, getting out on the court and starting starting to do some conditioning things. So um, uh, we'll see where where that goes. Coach, good evening, Paul Antunes, ESPN Brazil. Um, what is it about your team's style of play that's uh, allowed you to have so much success right off the bat and I miss a beat with Kevin out? Um, well, I think um, we had success before Kevin was here, so there's a, a, a lot of experience to lean on. And we've got a lot of talent, obviously. Uh, so the players have a more desperate mentality when Kevin is out. And... Um, you know, they know they have to perform at a high level in order for our team to do well. Uh, but to be able to lean on that experience, um, they know that they can uh, hold down the fort until he's back. But uh, we all know we're a much better team with him, and we're going to need him. So we're trying to do everything we can to keep this thing going until, until we get him back. Far back left-hand side. 
Steve, Nick Krupke from Fox 12 in Oregon. We've seen Dame and CJ raise their game to a whole other level this season. Uh, you've seen them grow over the times. Uh, how do they compare with other backcourts you go up against? And uh, you said so the other night, you know, you're never comfortable in those two on the floor. Uh, they're one of the best backcourts in the league. Um, I don't, you know, statistically and otherwise. I mean, they're a nightmare to have to to cover. They complement each other well. Um, they both score inside and out. Um, they've got the mid range, so they can beat you in a lot of different ways. And uh, so, obviously, when you play against them, you've got to have uh, everybody lined up defensively. All five guys have to be in tune and uh, ready to defend because you can't rely on one guy to to cover those two. Third uh, row, right hand side. Ron Karczyk, San Francisco Chronicle. Um, kind of related to the earlier question, Steph's obviously carried a lot of the scoring load since Kevin went out. But beyond any strategic changes, how do you think Steph approaches games differently with Kevin not there? I mean, he uh, clearly is sort of I don't know, his responsibility, or if he deferred it all to Kevin when Kevin first arrived, how does it sort of change the way you think Steph approaches the game? I think both Steph and Clay take on a, a bigger responsibility scoring wise, and they look to uh, to go into games more aggressively when Kevin is out. They know they have to. Um, we're you know pretty dependent on on their scoring, and uh, when when Kevin is not there, so you've seen it the last couple of games. You know they've both been very aggressive, and they'll they'll continue to to be so. Anybody else? Thanks. Great. Thank you. Coach Stotts will be All right. Here. That was Coach Steve Kerr. We'll hear from Coach Terry Stotts when we come back looking at Roddy Hood, who battled through a hyperextended knee injury in Game 1 to score 17 points in the Blazers' loss. Back with more on Game Time Live. Game 1 was a quick turnaround for the Blazers after beating Denver in Game 7 on Sunday. Here's Terry Stotts at the podium prior to Game 2. Terry, Nick Krupke from Fox 12, Oregon. How beneficial was it to have a full day to get some work in and actually practice here yesterday? You know, it was good. Being able to watch the game and, and see what things we can do better, what things we can do differently, uh, get some time on the court, uh, regroup. So it was a good day. Phil Barber, Santa Rosa Press Democrat. When you looked at tape of that game, did you see a lot of small adjustments you need to make, or did you see shots not going in by good shooters and you're confident that that will turn in this game? So um, I think we saw a lot of things that we can do differently and better. Um, offensively, when you look at our, you know, when you look at our shooting percentage, our three-point shooting, our shooting in the paint, our turnovers, um, Lack, that's a fine. Uh, you know, offensively, there's a lot we can do better. And the good thing is that what, what they did defensively isn't anything that we haven't seen in previous series. Uh, so, you know, we just will clean that up defensively. Um, you know, ad nauseum, we've seen the pick and roll defense. Um, I could get into the numbers and everything, but that was certainly part of it. But um, like I said, the fourth quarter, we're down six, and Curry had three points in the fourth quarter. We needed to be better uh, in the fourth quarter with our off-ball stuff. Um, so uh, I've, it was encouraging that there are things that we can do tonight that, or things that we can do better that we didn't do. Connor Letourneau, San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, Terry, what uh, what point did you see Dame really get comfortable with the 30-footer? When, when did that kind of become a, a key part of his arsenal? I think it's been gradual, but certainly this year was um, he had spent a lot of time over the summer, and I think it's been more obvious that this year was it was something that he was going to incorporate into his game. Uh, I think he's always had range, but uh, the time that he spent over the summer – this year was, I don't know if, if there was necessarily a point in the season um, that it happened, but it was just uh, over the course of his career, it was just kind of gradual. Other questions? Okay, wrap it up there. 
There's someone back there. Kevin Durant may be out for the entirety of the series. We'll find out more in just a few moments. How different is it for you to try to prepare defensively for this team with or without him on the court? Uh, well, with him on the court, there's just, just another uh, great offensive player. And so when you put him out there with, with Steph and Clay, it, it's really challenging from a defensive standpoint. Um, and his versatility in, in his offense. Um, when you take him out of it, uh, I, think, I think they do play a different style. Certainly Curry gets more involved. I think Clay gets more involved uh, because they need to. And so uh, the focus or emphasis on those two guys probably becomes a little bit more. Okay. Thanks. All right, that is Terry Stotts. And again, there should be an update on Kevin Durant's status in, in the next few moments. In fact, the Warriors saying they're going to reevaluate him pregame and then give us some sort of maybe timetable perhaps on when he may be back or maybe just when he may get on the court to, to start practicing. But back with Chris Bosch joining us here, Grand Hill, Isaiah Thomas, Jared Greenberg. Let's, Isaiah, what, what do we expect here from, from Portland in terms of adjustments that we're going to see that the average fan can watch right away in game two and say, this is different. Well, I, you know, I, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, guard play in terms of Portland's offense getting off the charts. Um, but I, I think the biggest adjustments that we need to look for is defensively, what are they going to do with Clay and Steph? Will they, will they hard hedge him? Will they trap him? Will the big come up and show hard on the screen? And if we see that adjustment being made, then that's one thing that we can look for in the game. Second thing that we need to look for in the game is will they take the bigs off the floor, play with smaller people, maybe put Evan Turner in the game and let him play a little bit. But Maurice Harkless joked after game one, that, that, and he was joking, that we need to play Evan Turner at the five. <laughs> That's the way we should well, play. Well, he, he's a good matchup for Draymond Green, I think. Now, Draymond's a much better rebounder, right. but in terms of what they both do out on the floor in terms of handling the basketball, distributing, so forth and so on, skill-wise, they do match each other you know you know these matchups they're all about matchups and this is tough for Portland because of how they defend pick and roll you know Ennis Cantor, Cantor has never been a guy to come out and hard show um, or, or, or play at level of the ball or do you know some of the things that Chris demonstrated on the court that's not who he is there's a reason why Terry Stotts had his uh, had his scheme have having Cantor stay in the paint and so I, I just I worry if you if you try to bring him out or even Zach Collins he's a young player right. a good young player but not extremely mobile in terms of getting out there, that's not who they are. This is what this is how they've played all season, and so it's it's a tough matchup for Portland. I, I think you're going to get more of the same. I think Dame and 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 and, uh, and CJ will play better, but it just won't be enough for the the high powered offense of Golden State. Chris, does the Portland backcourt have to outscore the Splash Brothers to give Portland a chance? They don't need to outscore them, but they need to be right there with them. They need to be who they are. I think if you look at their season averages, their playoff averages, you'll get a certain number. And they do have to have a certain type of output because they are the one and two options for that team. So they need to – it would be way easier if they're on fire, which, you know, <laughs> no question about <laughs> it. said than done. Chris, we're coming back here as we inch closer and closer to tip-off of game two of the Western Conference Finals. On 